How does it feel to know this song is about you? It's all about you. It's been about you. How does it feel to know this song is about you? How does it feel to know this song is about you? You guys are play this at home while you're chilling in your room alone. Can you see me or no? All right. Let's do it. Um, so, you know, one thing that's always been on my mind that I've, I've, I don't think you and I have ever really talked about um, in, in depth is how you like, r- like really dove into teaching yourself the guitar, learning the guitar, learn, teaching yourself singing. Like, like, I mean, you've, you know, I, I don't know if you ever, I really don't know your journey studying both instruments and songwriting. And like, like I know, I know certain things over the years cause we've been friends for so long of like, like when you were, when you were studying songwriting, like a particular artist or something like that. Um, and I remember moments when you were in certain bands where you would say like, I was, I'm really working on my ear training, a specific ear training thing or something like that. But I think I know for my students, what would I think be so cool to hear about is, you know, what it, what it was like for you, like falling in love with both instruments or, or one, whichever one you want to talk about, but like, just, and what you did, like what, what happened? Like how, how did, you know, and, and maybe the guitars were the place to start, but like, uh, you know, cause I think the guitar was first, mm-hmm. uh, right. Yes. Um, but yeah, like I just uh, because you, you you to my knowledge you you did a lot, if not all, like really self self taught, like you you know, and developed your ear and all that stuff. So maybe that would be a cool place to start. Is uh, sure. kind of the beginnings of you getting into music. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the the very beginning of it was. Um, the Little Shop of Horrors, the movie. Wow, really? It was, it was a musical, yeah. And I was watching it way younger than I should have. <laughs> um, hence, developing the personality of the plant later on in life. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I really loved that music. And I used to, I never knew the lyrics, really. I, I couldn't really hear a lot of what they were saying. So I just kind of make up my own thing. And I'd just be singing it you know what i mean trying to sing it and i just loved it so much and i I watched it every day i must have been like four years old and i just find the tape and put it in and the music sparked you know this thing and and of course um i was i grew up on disney and stuff so you had like uh, yeah the little mermaid the lion king um aladdin and and all this stuff And, and the music always was very was always such a powerful part of things. I think maybe more so than it, than it may have been for the average kid. Um, Mm -hmm. It probably, uh, probably affected me more. And um, I, um, I was very affected by music. You know, I, I, as you know, like I had a father who was a musician for a living and songwriter and, um, it was, you know, I always loved his music and everything too. I, he he was a um, talented songwriter. So his yeah. songs moved me. Um, but like, I remember like the movie Ghost would come on and, uh, you wow. know, Patrick Swayze and uh, Demi Moore mm-hmm. and the song Unchained Melody would come on and I couldn't stay in the room because I just start blowing my eyes out hearing the music and I I couldn't have anybody know. So I'd like you know, sneak out of the room, pretend I had to use the bathroom or something. And it was just too overwhelming. I couldn't handle whatever it was emotionally, but it was so powerful. And I definitely wanted to be a part of that power of having some hand in overwhelming somebody like that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It got me into, I guess, just the arts and just, uh, you know, acting and, you know, wanting to make movies and stuff. But, you know, my desire to be a part of music came very early. And my father always tried to put a guitar in my hand since I was very little. And wow. I never I never wanted to put the work in. It was, you know, okay. working and practicing to get there. I, it just wasn't my thing. Um, I, I was just going to 
do whatever was coming naturally to me, um, which seemed to get a big response out of people a lot of the time, which is why I was just acting so much, you know? Okay. I was always uh, performing. It was always an acting performance and always a show I was putting on in some way. And um, that was like my thing. But the music, you know, I remember um, getting into Boston when I was mm. fourth grade. And it was like, you know, the song more than a feeling. I I would just like think, think about what that would be like to be on stage presenting that song. It was just like, oh, you know, that's it. You know, that's just something so powerful and so moving. Yes. You know, for me at that age, you know, it was just like, you know, the, the song was blowing my mind, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, um, I still didn't want to put the work in, but you had, <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, the story. Um, you had Green Day and, uh, and they came out with Brain Stew. Um, mm -hmm. I think the album was called Insomnia. And, okay. Or Insomniac or something. I don't even know. But I uh, they had the song Brain Stew on it. And I decided, me and my friends decided we were going to do a band. And that is Amazing. where I first picked up the guitar and did something with it. I, I learned how I was so inspired to do this that I learned how to read tab. And I learned mm. two finger power chords. Yes. And I learned brain stew. And, and it was, it, it came pretty quick. I had learned some drum beats also. Now I think about it. And everything. So I had some kind of rhythmic um, idea of things through that, which was very hard for me. Like I, I spent a whole day learning a beat. Uh, that's how I started. My father told wow. me, I asked him, I said, just give me something. And he told me how to like, you know, uh, pat my hands, what need to pat my hands on my foot. And I, I started yeah. doing, uh, it was a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. now that I think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so it was like, you know, getting that coordination, it took like a whole day, but I just, I wanted it so badly because I thought it sounded so cool. You know, what he showed me and I was like, all right, you know, so I had, you know, some kind of thing. So, learning the guitar learning brain stew which is just a very simple thing i was clearly the best at it out of everyone out of my friends and stuff and i clearly had some kind of musicality to me that mm -hmm. they did not not have and they wanted it just as bad but they weren't wow. getting there and and i thought you know i'm like special right i'm mm -hmm. special musically i'm a musical guy yeah. Um, but I never revisited after that for, for a long time. I just learned that one song and I, it, it started feeling pretty comfortable with it. And I, you know, it, it was, it was cool. And it was like very natural. Okay. Put the guitar down. Didn't look back. Um, got in, got more into acting, uh, ideas of directing and stuff. And it wasn't until the, um, the Zeppelin stuff came out, uh, how the West was one and the DVD in 2003 that i wow married again and i was 17 at that point and uh it was the dvd um i uh the first tune comes on it's um it was from 1970 uh royal albert hall and the first tune was we're gonna groove and it was zeppelin in a way i'd already gotten into zeppelin's music but it still wasn't i wasn't like oh i'm gonna do it you know i'm gonna yeah. uh, learn this or anything nothing like I, I was just enjoying it as a fan and that was it mm -hmm. and um then that dvd happened and, and it was the second song which was uh i can't quit you babe and uh it was in the middle of that song that i knew right then that i couldn't sing because i was i always had a really bad ear and i've always been discouraged um, for my father, who was a musician and everything, he had a natural, he was naturally gifted. His ear was incredible. And, you know, he just figured, you know, you're born with what you're born with. You can't improve that. That's how he knew. He he never had wow. to improve that, really. And my sister's wow. the same way. My sister, you know, has was born with an incredible ear and an incredible voice. And they could just sing. And I was just wow. kind of like tone deaf, uh, terrible tone. You know, and always like, don't, don't do as, as, as enthusiastic and as passionate as, as I would have been about it. They, they were always like, you know, don't do that, you know, do something else. Oh. And, uh, 
So you, you could see like what I was up against is that like the people that I were closest to me and that I looked up to the most, my older sister and my father, yeah. they, were, they were basically telling me it's not in the cards for you. So I just kind oh. of, you know, when I saw the, the DVD, I was like, man, I said, uh, I saw Plant, uh, Robert Plant singing and I thought, I, I I thought that he's where he's going inside himself to bring this out, the expression. I knew right then that I knew that place and I knew that the two of them didn't know that. Oh, but that's all I had. That's all I had. But okay. I knew it. I was sure. But I said, there's something about where he's going. If I could only sing, if I could only, mm. you know, um, do that. But I just, I, I, I don't have it. So Jimmy Page and I don't think this would have happened with any other band, but wow, Jimmy Page was cool enough, more than cool <laughs> enough for me to be yeah. like, okay, I'll just play guitar because what he was doing on that song was just like, I, it's still going to work. It's gonna, still going to work out for me. Wow. And, um, so I picked up the guitar right then. I grabbed the guitar in the middle of that tune. I think it's about six minutes they did. And uh, I just grabbed it and asked my Start dad. Start playing Brain Soup? Say that again. <laughs> I just revisit <laughs> myself. Get my sea legs back. I just said that. I said, you know, can you show me what what can I start with? What can you give me? And he just gave me the uh, pentatonic scale, and that was mm -hmm. it. In the um, on the fifth fret, the A position, and I just started learning that. And uh, he told me to pick up and down. He told me to do alternate picking, and he told mm -hmm. me to anchor my pinky on the strings. He was, okay. he was telling me basically. He was starting me off doing things that he doesn't do. He was trying to mm. stop me from developing his bad habits. Um, okay. And, you know, That's so pretty I, cool. Uh, yeah. And it was, it was a good thing. And, um, and that was it for me with him, me and him both. I didn't want to learn from him because I wanted to do it myself. And he okay. didn't want to teach me because he wanted me to do it myself you know that's so, so cool or, yeah. or, so he, or so he says that's the reason but <laughs> he, he definitely was like I, I think he was prouder of me kind of like just doing it on my own and um you know obviously there were some zeppelin solos i was really into that and there was some uh stuff that i would ask him about i remember uh asking him about certain details on song remains the same the song okay okay and um black dog the the opening you know riff yeah the opening riff solo thing in the solo section and uh mm. you know just little details and stuff but you know it was definitely hard for me to make out notes uh the amount of notes within a measure or anything like that that was you know i could scat the rhythm of it i just couldn't hit the pitches you know it was, it was just kind of wow. like that. but but I felt the pitches, the, the the feeling that I got when listening to these things. If you had changed a couple of notes in them, it clearly would have been different in me. It wouldn't have mm. been that. And when it, whenever the real notes finally came in, it was like, oh, it was such a powerful feeling because it's like, you know, that's it. And I just couldn't. Um, none of this was conceptualized inside myself yet in any kind of mapping even just like intuitively it was just it was pure emotion and uh it wasn't until you know i was so passionate about it and i spent so much time um listening and doing it that my ear just started to get better and i started noticing uh you know the certain um intervals as oh yeah he does that here in this one too and it started becoming like you know, more familiar. And then the whole thing opened up and I could hear every single, nothing I could mistake basically. And, wow. um, and I still wanted to sing. So like, I guess a couple of years into it, I, uh, eventually was just like, I got to figure this out. You know, I, I feel like I gotta be doing this. You know, I, I feel like I would be so happy and excited if I could just get on a stage and sing and sing you know? yeah and yeah. um so i started spending a lot of time trying to do that and man you're talking about like you know 
my method of like putting things together and learning, you know, uh, especially at that point was just so uh, overcomplicated, you know, it, it was insane. It was just so from scratch, you know, yeah. everything. And, um, especially with that. And, um, you know, my father saw that I was just going down that road no matter what. And he was like, all right, well, you know, he gave me a couple pointers, a couple of exercises, little scale things to kind of work on. He gave me some old tapes from a guy that uh, sat with him and did uh, scales with him. And uh, I would sing to the tapes, you know, in the car. Wow. And um, and then he actually found that guy and um, got me a few lessons with him in the city. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And he, uh, he basically told me that I had really bad allergies and I got to take uh, – mucinex i think and you know and that kind of stuff didn't really work out for me it kind of dried me out but other stuff that he mentioned i guess practice you know warming up softly for 20 minutes and then waiting 10 minutes and then going into the performance that has been something that i've stuck by um, wow if i if i'm doing that and um that was that was pretty much that, it but it was that's exciting. from the that was from his, his name was Don. Lewis. Cool, and he had cool. A lot of uh, a lot of big names and everything. So I felt like I was in good hands. And sure, <laughs> and I, yeah. What's that? I was going to say sure. I mean, that's 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 awesome. And, yeah, and like yeah. the and you know even just getting those practical tips on, uh, you know, warming up. I think like anybody, you know, any instrument. I think I always think it's good to have that warm up. You know, before even if you're just practicing, you know, like, like even before practice, it can be, it can be really good to kind of allow yourself to have that warm up time. So it's cool that, you know, to, to, even if that's what you, all you really took from, from this guy, like, that's a big thing, I think, it's for every big. musician. It's big. I think hearing it from him made me more, it made it more important to me. Right, right. Yes. I, okay. I kind of yeah. prioritized that, you know, for a while. And um, much more earlier on that I than I really do now, unless I'm doing something really important. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, important to me anyway. Um, but <laughs> you know, so that that's basically how it happened. And then it, you know, it reached a level. You know, there were certain days where, you know, I would make these leaps in my ability that I'll never okay. forget. That. Uh, that were like dream come a dream come true every single time. And uh, it was like, uh, it, it was like a birthday celebration, you know, when, when wow. it's, all of a sudden there was like a breakthrough in my ability to, you know, belt something or, or keep a steady, uh, a steady kind of tone with this, with the breathiness and everything. I'm just taking notes and suddenly it's kind of like this, um, you got a bunch of tools to work with kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you start using them more naturally and, and uh, you know, switching them more naturally and they become more appropriate to what it is you're emoting, I guess. And, and then I felt like a rock star and then I was like, yeah, okay, you know, going out there doing, and people, you know, uh, I, it was definitely received really well. And then uh, my father saw the visitors. I, I joined the visitors, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yes. And he saw us and he videotaped us um, uh, down Port Jeff, a play a town Long Island. And um, it was just, uh, he was shocked, you know? He was shocked. So was that the first, was that the first, that the first, time, first time that he time really, really, yeah. He was like, you wow. know, and, and, and he told me, he was like, you know, you, you did it. Like you did, you did what I wow. did. It was really possible. So, that was cool. And, and I guess the most rewarding aspect of that is that it was truly all from myself and my own passion and my own desire for it, you know, and that's what drove the whole thing. And I didn't need when it's strong enough, you don't need anyone to encourage it mm. you're going for it, no matter what you can feel discouraged at certain points, but you're not giving up. There was nothing there was nothing inside me that was going to just throw it away, you know, unless I thought there was some kind of <clears throat> damage that was, you know, yeah, 
not right. recoverable or I just have no voice. I, you know, it would take a very extreme thing for me to go in a different direction at that point. And, you know, I came out the other end with, uh, with more than anybody had expected. And it was, uh, you know, it gave a lot of confidence and excitement and, you know, it was, it was a cool time in my life for, for, uh, for a while, you know, there was like, you know, riding high with that and, you know, something to claim and, you know, being part of bands and stuff and with that. And it was, it was a lot of fun, but um, now I look at all that differently. You know what I mean? I, I, I wanted to be a rock star, you know, um, and so much of it had to do with just being a rock star. And, and so much of it now is just about the quality of music and the quality of whatever it is that I'm, I'm a part of or creating. And, you know, it's yeah. definitely a different, a different thing now. Um, okay. But you can, uh, so. no, no, no. I, I don't want to stop you. I mean, this is, no, I don't want to stop you. This is great. But I, there's a couple of things if we could hold, hang on that moment, maybe like this moment in time for a second that I think would be really cool to just explore a little bit for the listeners. Um, one of the things that instantly was like, like I was reminded was that I think re I want to relate to a lot of, you know, my drum students is those moments that, that you just mentioned of like the peaks of like, you know, your, your practice and your study where it's like, Oh man, like I just nailed this thing. Like it's like the, those 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 huge moments, and it reminded me of a time when I was in music school where <clears throat> we were. There was like this common area with like a bunch of practice pads, and the drummers would like random drummers would students would just be like drumming away. And there was a practice hall, like practice room hall, like down down the way. And one of my buddies, like randomly, I'm like I'm in there just like doing whatever, some kind of rudimental thing one of my buddies comes running out like, I got it. I got it. And I'm like, <laughs> we're all like, you got what, you know? And he said he, he, he was, he was just freaking out. And it just reminded me of like the, what you were describing. He's freaking out. And it could be for him. It, it was, it was this, this small thing. It could be the smallest thing, right? Like that you were working on. And in this particular case, so for you drummers listening, it was a molar technique thing where he was playing 16th notes with one hand on the hi hat. So kind of like a, like a funk groove, you know, but trying to get it steady. And so where the hand is kind of bouncing, like you're kind of dribbling a basketball, you know, mm -hmm. but he, he was particularly trying to do it in like Latin music. Cause you know, in a samba or something, you're really cranking that, that ride symbol, you know, or hi hat. And so he he was always hearing from our teachers like not good enough not good. I mean I was always hearing that too like we all were you know and uh, but he came running out he's like I've been doing this for the last twelve hours in the just going right, right, right. you know yeah. and he wasn't kidding and he finally <laughs> comes out of this room but it you what you described there just made me think of that and i just wanted to like kind of hang on that for a second for all of the listeners it's like those moments are huge and they're real and it's not um it's not just it, it, it's for ever like it happens to all of us on an instrument right and you can go a long time i find in between those moments right yeah. like there could be a real long time. And that's an interesting place to be in the in-betweens, you know, oh, when you're learning an instrument, you know, or, or whether it's learning an instrument or maybe you're rehearsing with a band and you guys are like either writing songs and you're trying to come up with a particular part and, and you're, or, or something's missing and like, or whatever it is, or, or you're putting, putting a show together of cover music and like, you're just not happy with the quality of, of your performance or whatever you could have, extended periods of time in music where you feel like you're on like a plateau and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, you hit this huge peak. Sometimes the peak lasts right for a little bit, like where, you know, it first you grab the one thing and then all of a sudden there's a couple other things, but sometimes it could just be that small little, like his one handed 16th notes, right? That one little technique, or in your yeah. case, it may, maybe it was a, you know, a particular way, particular note you were trying to hit with a particular tone at from a particular particular place in your throat or, or in your voice, you know, 
And, and that could be just one element of something you do over the course of a six minute song, you know, totally. right. It's totally. like, but so <clears throat> I just love, I just love that. And uh, I wanted to ask about that in between period. Like how did you approach those plateaus, let's call it, you know, where you come off this high of like grabbing that thing you were looking to get. And then you feel in the moment, right? We feel like, okay, this is going to kind of last, like I did it. Like, so I'm going to get the next thing now, you know, cause like everything's feeling good. So how did you, yeah, yeah. How, yeah, the how did you navigate those? Say that again. I was just going to say, how did you navigate those, those peaks and valleys of practice and, and, and learning, I should say learning. Yeah. Well, it was uh, definitely a tough thing, you know, it's mm. ev everything, you know, the expectations were radically changing all the time. Um, yeah. You know, when things looked grim, it was like you're up against a wall. You know, it seems it seems like everything's impossible. Um, and when things seem great, it's like, you know, it, you know, you feel like, you know, what you're talking about, like, oh, I'm going to get the next thing. You feel like you're going to, you know, one day you're going to be better than anybody. Right, you're gonna yeah. be the absolute best. It's all a bunch of bullshit, but um, you know, finding where you're gonna actually be, you know, in a in a psychological circumstance like that, it's you just you'll know when you're there. You know what I'm saying? So you're you're yeah. kind of trudging along, and you know, you you gain some things along the way, and the more you gain, the less extreme those changes in the perception are because you mm -hmm. see how far you've come and you see that, like you said, it's real. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I would say that like the things that were gained that were consistent, cause I was up against a lot. There were allergy issues there. There was acid reflux at one point, you know, I, I had gone through, you know, uh, yeah. procedures for that. Um, but you know, so sometimes like if something wasn't consistent, I, I didn't know why. And I, you know, my best guess was just not going to be the right one, you know? So it was like, mm -hmm. I can tell you that it required to get to where I'm at now. Um, yeah. what I'm capable of ensuring in a performance, um, having preparation, everything required so much patience that, Mm. It, it, the experience of, of it taught me patience that I didn't have prior. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it was that. And, uh, you know, where we kind of left off before, you know, what I had to work with really was not even near what I have to work with now. But yes. it was, I, I had made a, enough leaps that remained consistent. That's where the happiness really comes in is when, you hit something and then you understand how you did it and then you can do it anytime and it always comes mm. out right. And then suddenly it's like, you know, that confidence comes in there and it's, you feel more, I guess, legitimate, you know, in that, yes, you know, as a singer or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, so the, the in-between periods can last a while. You know, I know that, you know, when I was in the visitors, I, I felt like, you know, somewhat I've like reached the top or something. I don't know what I thought. But I, yeah. Uh, so that was probably the least experientially. I didn't feel confusion. I didn't feel uncertainty. That's probably the most sure I've ever felt about my abilities and my contributions um, ever. And I was being. Wow. I was being validated by it every day, whether the validation was on point or not. You know, I was, mm -hmm. there was that experience naive, but um, the experience was great. And, you know, there was of course a lot of talent there and, and there was definitely enough there. I don't look back and go, geez, I, I can't, I can't listen to myself. It's, it's cool. I just heard something today earlier on. Actually, I, I listened to uh, that track, the, the letter of Christ. Yeah. And um, I was like, man, <laughs> it's pretty good, you know. Some uh, it's good happening there, yeah. So I mean, 
I'm proud of everything that happened. And like you said, it was real. And, and when that happens, when you make, whenever you're doing something that requires some kind of tr training and practice and everything, you start seeing the changes. It's mm -hmm. almost like magic. It's yeah. almost like some kind of uh, godliness type thing. You yeah. Know? I, when I was a kid, when I was really little, probably around the time I was uh, watching the Shop of Horrors, I actually <laughs> I was obsessed. I had my own garden. I had a, a vegetable garden because my father had brought home these seeds. Some Somebody gave him like a huge garbage bag with filled with these seed packets. And he was like, you want, you want to look at this? I'm like, yeah. You know, like, it was like four in the morning. He came home. I don't know. That's I'm amazing. Like, I'm like looking through it. I'll never forget. And we got Christy's light on, my, my sister, and we're, we're both you know, we're rummaging through this watermelons, cantaloupes, you know, zucchinis, everything. And uh, you got the directions on the back. I couldn't even like really decipher it. But um, I saw the pictures of these things and, and I opened one of the packets. And I see the seeds and I'm like, this is really going to happen? Like this, no way, you know? And, and I had to know, I had to see this. So um, my mother just carved out this little uh, rectangle in the backyard for me. And, uh, put some stakes there and everything. And she read the packets and told me like how deep I got to put my finger and put it. So I, you know, I'm doing this and I, I would go to my, my baby pool with my uh, sprinkler thing, get the water. Every yeah. morning. I'd just be waiting for this garden to grow. And back then, you know, when yeah. I'm seeing this come out of the ground for the first time, it's blowing my mind and I'll never forget. Yeah. It was like, it was this miracle and it was this kind of like, I don't know, it, it, it was like this powerful feeling of like knowing that you know how to do this now, you know how to do something that is incredible and, and help propagate something like that. Yes. And, you know, so I watched it come out and, you know, watermelons and cantaloupes and the whole thing. And, and, you know, seeing it happen like that as a kid and being a part of that and basically doing, you know, once she said it, she forget, she forgets. I'm just doing it every day and all I'm doing is watering it. But I remember, you know, checking out, it was like storming outside and my mother didn't want me to go outside. And I just snuck out just so I could look. I remember like the rain is like brushing away the, uh, the dirt on the, the tops of these turnips, I'm seeing like the roots in the ground. I'm seeing, I'm like, because I couldn't even see that before. I was like, oh, man. yeah, I'm freaking out. And that's kind of like what it was to practice singing is that like those changes that come and suddenly you're different now. You have this now. You didn't have that before. And it's a huge difference. And where I wound up in like one year, I think, after like really starting. What the difference was if I had sang, if I'd gone out and sang prior to that, um, nobody would have cared. You would have had people in there making jokes, most likely. Mm. It would have been it would have been bad. Yeah. Where after that year, I, I don't think I could have gone anywhere given it half of what I had and not have people come up to me and go, wow, dude. Oh, I'm so to And, and thinking that I'm a natural, that was that was the craziest part about it. It's like this is there's nothing natural in the sense that you're you're thinking 
right here. This is not, you know, it was coming naturally because it's amazing. The expression was naturally because it was so integrated and ingrained at that point. But, you know, I didn't come out of the womb singing like my sister. My sister is born with the ability to sing and, and the right tones and everything. And she just doesn't want to do anything with it. But, um, <sighs> yeah, yeah. So it, it was, uh, there's something about that, uh, you know, you're making me think of the beginning of the story of your story where you're like, or, or in the early stages where that thing you recognized in Robert Plant, you know, is now you, now you're able to tap into right at this point in this, in the journey. And because you've done so much work, you know, practicing and learning the instrument, your voice and so that thing that, as you described, that, you know, your sister and your dad maybe weren't really tapping into, that yeah. thing that you instinctively did have is now able to come out with the instrument that they have, that you now have, because of that long journey and because of that devotion and that love and that passion and that care. Um, man, I think this is so cool. And I, I really, um, I'm excited about all that all the places we could go in this, in this conversation. But I, I really, I know that, that your story, like what you're saying right now about learning, like, like just, I mean, you could apply this to anything in life, but for our listeners, you drummers, like, I know there's a lot of you who have a similar story in the sense of like thinking the drums were cool, but, but feeling like, man, I don't know what the heck, like, like this is, you know, not happening, you know, and, and maybe family members saying like your experience, which is like, yeah, it's just, I don't think you have the the beat, you know, like, like in the sense of the drummers. Right. And so to hear, hear you talk about this, I think is going to be so fruitful for so many people because, um, because of, because of the achievement, you know, because of like your, like the proof there, you know, that it's so possible, you know, Not sure. Sure. Um, I did want to ask before we go to some things that you're making me think about as like one more part of this kind of beginning of your, your journey as a musician, um, you mentioned the listening, you know, whether that be in relation to you learning the guitar or, you know, obviously learning to sing and understanding intervals and all this stuff, um, and notes and scales, um, my students, probably are going to be like, yeah, this is like a broken record from Nick. Uh, how much I stress listening to records and studying records and like listening to songs and studying songs and how important that is. And I, I feel like, and you used to teach, maybe you still do, I don't know, but I know you used to teach uh, guitar lessons. Um, so you might've run into this with your students too, but I know with mine, often I'll get, like parents who maybe buy they'll, they'll buy the book or you know like a lesson book or whatever from the music shop and um or or maybe it's an adult and they buy the you know drums 101 or whatever kind of book mm -hmm. and it's those are really helpful and great but i getting them out of the book getting them to be like to try to play along to a song and there's that hesitation of like yeah but the but the book says i should be doing you know, this beat this way or whatever. And I don't know how that connects to, I don't under, I don't even understand. Like maybe there's a fear there of like, I don't even know what, what Guns N' Roses is doing here. I don't even know what Prince is doing here. You know, like I don't, I don't want to go there, you know, but I'm yeah. always telling my students, like, you got to just sit and listen. Like, e even if like, I'm even stressing, like e carve out in your practice time, time to just sit with a record and listen to it. Don't even, don't even pick up your sticks yet. You know, like try to really hear. So can you talk about like what that process was like, like the, how much like the listening and like, like what was that like? And, and, and um, when you were learning either the guitar or, or singing, well, like how important was it to you? You know, I didn't have um, a stage where I wasn't listening and learning outside mm. of that initial scale that he showed me. I learned the scale. I went up and down. He also showed me three no coils with it. Um, okay. And, and from there, I was just listening to Jimmy Page. 
And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one little thing that, that would come out at a time, you know, it, there were certain little moments that always, you know, really swept me off my feet. And those are the moments I was like, what, you know, what is going on? And, they, and, you know, it's like there was something special going on there, especially like when you develop as a player and you see what the difference is about an idea that comes out at a certain time, whether it's just the effect of it overlaid against a certain chord or, you know, something that's different itself and it's the order of its notes and stuff. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it was just that process, you know, uh, right out of the gate, pretty much, I was... Um, with the Heartbreaker solo, trying to do, you know, the live thing from, you know, of course, and it was absolutely awful, I'm sure, you know, the way it was <laughs> back then. But it was the beginning. It was just the, you know, it was the first try. Um, and feeling confident, oh, I got this. I got this, you know, and it, it's wrong. Yes. It's wrong and not knowing, <laughs> you know. and, and Yeah, 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 yeah. The thing about like becoming a better player and especially if you're trying to um, decipher what uh, if certain music that you love, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of the time, you know, not just with me, but I'm sure with a lot of other people, uh, they, they go through a process of learning how to learn mm -hmm. and learning how to... First, you got to care if it's right or not, because a lot of people will be like, oh, that's good enough. And they know yes. that it's probably not, you know, what it is, but they're just going to go with it because, you know, maybe this percentage of the ears that are in the audience won't care or hear the difference. Maybe, you know, that's just their theory, possibly. But, you know, if you care that it's actually right, you know, you'll come across those moments where you realize the deepest part of your your confidence and perception and, and belief that you've had it right have been wrong. And you've got to be willing to allow that to evolve and recalibrate and have a better, more accurate perspective going forward. And that doesn't end, you know, that you, yeah. you're, you're still not a perfect listener and a perfect decipherer. You know, there's there's going to be something that, you know, most likely there's going to be something that you come across that you think you have right. And you look back and it's almost like, how did I miss that? But also at the same time, it's like you're never going to miss something like that again, you know, and you're just yeah. building yourself. So, you know, it's been like a journey of a lot of other things. You know, my, my journey as a musician and learning music and stuff has been a journey of it's been a spiritual one. And, yeah okay you know learning about uh these very things and you know having to accept you know he, your ego has to become more flexible if you're going to um a lot of people i think their ego is going to have to become flexible more flexible if they want to get really good um some people you know just going to blaze all the way to the top you know they they, they don't yeah. have to really learn the but um, yeah, which is interesting because my, my father was so used to his setup genetically that mm. he didn't even know that an ear could be improved. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't even a concept. That, that was like a myth to him. You know? That's it's, unbelievable. That's amazing. It's so, That's it's funny. You know, I mean, yeah. him, his discouragement was coming from a place of love. It, it was he wanted right. to put me down a road that he thought was going to be good. It's just, you know, uh whether I was capable of it or not, I loved it too much to give up on. And that's, that's all that really was. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was uh, something I actually wanted to mention to you. That's yeah. Really ah, Cuba. I just came back. Okay. From Cuba. I was there for a week. First time, probably last time I'll ever go. Um, and it was very interesting. Um, you know, the, the people there, are all pretty desperate you know it's yeah. um not the greatest uh circumstances to live in as a as a cuban citizen um mm -hmm. and you know 
you have all these street musicians in these groups that are incredible. Yeah. And I, I have to say, like, just the art in general. I haven't really sent you any pictures or anything like that. Um, nope. Actually, yeah, not yet. I, I bought a few paintings. There was an art oh, gallery. Oh, wow. Dude. This really is like, you know, um, it was the it was the most consistent I've ever witnessed of just everywhere you look is the highest quality of wow. art and and performance yeah. it is like they clearly just live this they live it and i can tell you that it was just so common like everywhere you went the feel and the cohesion of like the the groups mm -hmm. it was like nothing you're gonna get here and what it kind of proved to me is that like obviously a huge part of that is the fact that it's so desperate there's a yeah. there's like this uh necessity to get something of value in you to make some kind of money. I mean, it is just like, you know, and a lot of these people have to just entertain, you know, especially since the tourism came back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the tourism is like a huge, huge thing there. And I got to say, like what it showed is that like, you know, you have all the greats that we look at and we're mm. like, man, that's just, that's, that's just them. You know what I mean? That is just yeah. uh, they're special, and they probably are just special genetically in the fact that maybe they didn't need those parameters to keep the thing going as, as the way they did. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you right now that these musicians were definitely as technically good and as soulful as anything I've ever seen. And it's amazing. It was just so – that's just the way it is there that it's like it, – it was kind of inspiring. It was, it was kind of like a lot more people are capable of absolute greatness on an instrument than we we really know. You know, it's mm -hmm. just like the, the potential is so high. Now, actually, you know – not living in circumstances like that and having to self-motivate that's the thing yeah and that's right. why it's so rare you know so that's really obviously it's there's such a big focus on that now probably more than ever um uh, you could surf youtube and find millions of videos on just that um yeah because a lot of people have realized like wow that's you know it's a big thing but to have experienced that and seen, okay, you know, obviously, you know, when th when the pressure's on and it's about necessity, the quality is going to be as high as the desperacy is. And it's high. It is the best. Wow. And it's like, you know, yeah, they, they don't, they don't miss a, a molecule. They, there's not one molecule out of place of what, where it should be. And it feels so good. And it, it's just wow okay so that should be such a thing you know what i mean if yeah if there's one thing i would tell my younger self it would be to pay more attention to take notes on motivating factors um to learn more about how to self-motivate you know yeah even though I had all the motivation in the world and it worked and it got me where I, I got, if I could go back knowing what I know now, I'd be there way quicker. You know, it would just yeah. be so much faster. Um, but yeah, I thought you'd find that interesting. I love it. I yeah. love it. It's, it, <clears throat> it all, it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Like that, that would be the case, you know? Sure. Um, and it also makes sense. Why, 
in our culture, in our society, it's so rare, you know, because we're so comfortable that, you know, and there's so many distractions, you, you know, it's easy to just, I mean, I know my students hear me talk about this all the time. Like it's easy to just put Netflix on, you know, rather than like, you know what, I really, I, I do have time to practice that thing I was trying to learn. You know, I do have time to listen to that record that my buddy told me about that I haven't listened to yet. You know, um, yeah. it's just, it, you know, it, it's so easy to put Fortnite on and play or, you know, uh, whatever, Minecraft, exactly. whatever, you know what I mean? Um, and, and we're Fortnite. so comfortable, especially Fortnite. Uh, we're, we're so comfortable, but like in, like you're saying, like in, in, in a, in a culture, like what they're we're living in, in Cuba, like, if that's all they have to, if that's all that's uh, available to, to give you something more, you know, it cause, cause it's also, there's also something deeply satisfying about playing music and learning or making art of any kind, you know, even if, even if there's maybe economic incentives, right? Like I want to stand, I, I need to stand out. I need to provide for my family. You know, this is an extra way that I can do that if I'm great, if, you know, and everybody's great. So I got to be better, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, th then, okay, there's that. But like, um, you know, but there's also something deeply meaningful behind, you know, making art and, and for, for even the artist, you know? You know, it's interesting because you know, you got this whole thing coming up with the artificial intelligence. Yeah. And um, it's really like just this thing that is quickly taking over more and more responsibilities that uh, belong to us, just people. Um, yeah. And relieving us of that, but also at the end of the day, when this thing is uh really gotten itself everywhere it's really gonna leave us with as contributors you know what i mean our our function yeah. as contributors is out the window at that point it seems right. and right. i've kind of faced this thing like recently because my motivations have gone through so many different um phases you know like i mm -hmm. said in the beginning well, you know, the first thought I had when I was looking at the Zeppelin thing, I'll never forget it, was that I, I felt very certain that people have not gotten this in a live setting since then. Yeah. And that I wanted to contribute to bringing something like that because that would just be amazing. But at the end of the day, I, wa I was like, well, this is... This is the if I could do something like this, I guarantee I could be a rock star. You know, that's it. Mm -hmm. So that was really it. It was about the chicks and the fame and all that. And then it became, it went through its shifts and it became um, more about a contribution, like more on that end of it. And yeah. um, and of course. There's a status in that, obviously. That's that's the root of the the motivating factor on some level. But yeah, then you know, then I'm writing this album just about creating a product that was going to be um, just very valuable for a lot of people. It's a very unique kind of uh, album, and you know, expression and everything. And it was going to be, you know, hopefully, you know very loved and, and that, that was it and then you know just recently um i got wind of like this uh songwriting producing ai thing that is mm. uh you know it i i saw it like get it prompted to create a country song about a b and c and f and you know there's like a singer and in the and it is is a fully produced country song and well, you, AI. yeah you you cannot possibly tell that it's not an organic voice on the other end and no way yeah man it's it's here like as far as country goes and country's a more simple thing you know it, i would say the other genres it had a harder time like convincing 
but the country song was like you can put this on the radio right now and it can possibly be a hit wow and and the, the thing generated it i think quicker than the length of the song actually was <laughs> and it's fully produced and written and the lyrics made complete sense and had like theme and like it was like and soul i mean <laughs> it's just <laughs> so I'm looking at this and I'm like, you know, this, this stuff. Maybe it says more about country music than it does about AI. Maybe. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't want to knock anything, but like, yeah, yeah you know, I know, I know, I know. It, it is what it is. The bottom line is, is that you know, whatever it can't handle right now, it's going to be able to handle tomorrow, effortlessly. Right. And right. you know, if it can do that, it's going to be able to do anything with this stuff eventually. You know, and. You know, everybody, I, I've noticed like a lot of people kind of like denying that. I noticed a lot of people, you know, attached to this idea of, of the contribution thing, which is fantastic. Um, but I thought at that point, the wind was just sucked out of my sails completely. You know, e even even the idea of my ex hearing it and even appreciating it on any, it was like, I, I, don't, I don't even think, she'll probably not even believe it's real. She'll think that that I prompted uh, this thing with my showed it my voice and just did this. I have no idea, but it's that convincing. And I I had wow. to, I was like flipping on that, and I realized like my mind's just gonna do what it's gonna do with this. I gotta find a different, deeper motivation. What is that? And truly, at this point, it is literally just because I started it. And it's something to do and put my mind to every day and inch it closer. And it's, I got to say, that, that might sound so ridiculous to some people, but mm. it's surprisingly the purest, most spiritually satisfying place that my creativity has come from yet. Yeah. And it's it is fulfilling, like to despite that that this thing, you'll be able to tell, you know, uh, write a, a love album about this, including these kinds types of interesting interest uh, instruments and all this, and it'll make an album that is probably a trillion times better than what I'm putting together right now. Mm -hmm. I, realized, I realized it's possible. I realized I how do i not care about that what what can i find inside and honestly it's like it's like somebody who has like a routine of like it, it's like they're knitting it's like a hobby kind of thing mm -hmm. and they they yes. knit as a hobby and it's something that you know throughout time just becomes smoother and better and you know uh, before you know it's just like this thing that happens and what happens is that they weave this you know beautiful cloth and whatever it is and right, it's, right. It is what it is. It's that creation, and that has always been more special. Yes. Oh, I, you know. Well, I, I. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is there is something. I mean, I I totally, I totally agree in in regards to like what AI is going to be able to do with everything, and and including music, you know. Yeah. But there is a, there is something in me that you know and for, for maybe as naive or whatever as this may sound but like there's just something about there to me there's always going to be that human thing that is just unquantifiable you know and maybe maybe that you know to connect to your cuba visit maybe AI w will only not be able to reach it when you're reach the human quantity, when you're in that kind of caliber of mm -hmm. creation, mm -hmm. you know, like what you experienced with the musicians that you came across and, and all of the different artists, you know, cause it's coming from the highest place potentially, um, spiritually, you know, uh, you know, and, and to what you're saying about your current process of the record you're working on 
mm-hmm. and your connection to the way you kind of parallel that with uh, the knitting. It's like, it's the example of like what true leisure should be and can be, you know, people think leisure, you know, I think I, on the f- face value, people think leisure is like, Oh, lazy. I'm just doing something for fun. It doesn't, it's not work. It's not anything, you know, right. but it's why I think it's so beautiful when adults like middle-aged adults want to learn music, you know, to, to bring it back to what I do, right. Like what, what you know, what we've been talking about. It's like when people like you get, it's rare, right? Like you go to a music shop and all of a sudden there's like a 50 year old or, or sometimes it's like we, I, I've seen, I've got friends who've taught like 70 year old people coming in cause they want, they want to learn guitar or something, you know, and it but never picked up an instrument before. But I, I think that's like incredibly beautiful because there's something you know, that's true leisure. That's learning. That's tapping into this thing that, that is coming from this really pure place, you know? And, um, it's not, you know, sure. There are some people that in that, in those positions that maybe they're just passing time or they're trying to fill their retirement or whatever, but, but there are people who aren't retired. Like what about the people in their, in their forties who just decide they're going to learn an instrument? I think there were a lot of people during the pandemic that did that, you know, and, and that they're still learning it, you know, and maybe the initial motivation might've been something a little face value, easy, simple pastime, but you get into that mode and like the weaving, uh, you know, um, knitting, the knitting thing, you know, it's like you get into that mode, you do it a little by little. And then all of a sudden, like, there is this creation at the end of it. And whether you're learning the drums just because you want to play drum beats or you want to play along to tracks, your favorite tracks on your stereo, or you want to, you've got some buddies who you want to get together with on the weekend and just jam in the garage or the basement, or maybe you want to do the weekend warrior gig thing, or maybe you want to play like a pro, you want to be a pro. It's like, doesn't matter, like any of those that all starting from that place of like, I'm, I'm learning. And it's, it's that true leisure. I don't know if that makes sense. But, um, you know, it's just, yeah, certainly does. It certainly does. And, and, you know, that's the thing, because I certainly don't have to be doing it. And, Mm -hmm. I could be doing a bunch of other things, including just being lazy and not doing anything. Right. That's easy. That's easy to do, but it's, I'm, I'm holding myself to it, I guess, because I figured out how to do that. And it was like a tighter squeeze when, when I got wind of the AI thing, when I saw the, as excited, I'll tell you, I'm excited about it. I'm excited Mm -hmm. for this thing to create music that, that I'm going to be able to be like a fan, you know, again, not a fan. It's, 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 it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'm going to be able to enjoy new music that's never existed before. And it's going to be, you know, I'm guessing it's going to know how to make it very enjoyable and very, you know, much better than what we've been getting for a while. I'm sure. Um, Yeah. But, um, and maybe much better than anything we've ever done, but, uh, you know, we are facing, a different world, most likely a very different mm-hmm. world. And it's coming pretty quick. And, you know, figuring out, you know, well, okay, like, what now, you know, it's really it has to be um, for the self. It really yeah, does, right. you know, and, and right. just something to put your mind to and you know like you said these creations you know just to have them it, it doesn't have to be a business it's just it's something to it's a hobby it's a hobby and mm-hmm. and you know hobbies you know when something is a hobby it's proof that the person probably loves it yeah you know? right right because then what why would you bother There's with it no right. other incentive it's just something they really just want to do you know Yes, um, unless they're testing themselves, you know, which in, in itself is something different. But right, yeah, I just—it's never been this before, 
And now it is this, and it's taught me so much about, it's just taught me so much about um, progression, you mm -hmm. know? And um, yeah. my pace and my intensity is different now. It's not what it was before. I don't feel like I have a gun to my head even a little bit with it. That that's a big difference, and it's truly just happening. I'm just doing it, and it's much. Yeah. It's it's the most enjoyable in a way than it ever has mm -hmm. been before. So uh, yeah, I, was, I find that interesting, and you know, it, it's probably worth bringing up just because of what we're kind of potentially facing really soon. Yes, no, absolutely. I think this is great. This this whole conversation is great. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, wanted to ask a little bit about, well, so you've mentioned you've been in, you've played in a bunch of bands, you've got the band thing down, mm. the band experience in all facets, I think, right. The journey of being in different bands <laughs> right. and all that that entails. Yeah. Um, but, and, and, but one of the things that I think, um, I've got a lot of students right now who are, you know, starting to, or have been, um, you know, playing gigs and things like that, or they're, they're, they're in their bands or they're auditioning for bands and, and they want to play gigs. You've played a bunch over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what that's like? I know there was a period of time. I remember where you were, uh, like even in a duo, right where you were like consistently gigging like like i think like out east on long island or something like that um but you've also played a bunch of solo acoustic shows you've played shows with bands like full full bands um what what's you know is there any tips or insight into life getting on stage you know that process maybe preparing for a gig um or just some of the the things that you've run into in the gig, you know, like anything at all, you know, I just, that would be, well, for that me, I find that I'm sorry. What was that last part? Uh, just anything at all that, that you might think is interesting, you know? Um, for me, when I kind of like, it's very easy for me to over prepare. Um, not in the sense that everything falls apart, but in the sense that it kind of somehow, gets in the way at least a little bit of okay. what, what's coming out, you know, and a lot of the time when I'm like, feel super prepared with everything. And I, I get on stage and I play every note, right. And I do everything the way I feel is best and okay. And everything. And I'm like, wow, that was, that was a perfect show. And I listen back to it and I'm like, I sound like a freaking robot. Like that, that's not wow. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Not, not the robots that sound natural, you know? <laughs> Not the AIs. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it sounds awful. So I kind of like, I'm not the most responsible in the sense of like, I found myself a lot by the seat of my pants, just like, you know, uh, leaving to a gig right after you know, just uh, being at a friend's house, watching something, just going to the gig, barely warming up, getting in there. And it's just raw. And it's something that is so much looser, um, mm. you know, but it, it requires so many um, elements to be integrated so they can dance because they dance on their own. But these are things that have been practiced, you know, and you kind of yeah. let this thing underneath you move them around on its own. And yeah. that is where I feel like the real expression comes from. Whereas when you're like, oh, I got to remember, I got to do this first. I got, you know, there are times that I just went on and I just started with a song that I never started with before. And I don't care. You know what I'm saying? I can't care. That's That's the whole thing. The more you care... If if you have to care, you're not ready. Mm, that's how. That's how. That's good. Right? Like this stuff yeah. should be so, you know. And and look, a lot of people, a lot of people may not find the value 
in the things I find valuable in music, right? They may listen to, sure. you know, these these gigs that I've done and go, oh, this guy just is unprepared. He's just, the, you know, but it's paid off for me, you know, and I feel the best in it. And I feel like that's that's the coolest thing. And it's not about like, oh, yeah, I, I got to be that way because it's cool or it's badass or some stupid crap. It's literally like if I if I just give it too much, if I give it too much care, it's never going to the the depths of me are, are never going to open up. If if I make the criteria of my contentment so strict and and su such a heavy load, then the chances of me reaching that template of perfection for me to be like oh and just like open up and be completely natural very slim you know yeah. and then you know, people people that are following that kind of uh train of thought a lot of the time you'll hear about their perfect show oh i have this and i know that's possible i know what it has to be and they haven't learned this yet maybe i don't know but like you always hear about this one show and it's like why is it that one show it's because of how low the odds are that it's going to go the way you need it to go you know what i'm saying when you have such a thing um you gotta let it be i, I in in my mind i have to let it be looser than that i have to yeah. you know have my dreams about and have my ideas of what it should be um and also not take them too seriously and mm. that's what the real magic comes out you know the best moments so much of the time are not the ones you previously imagined. They're the ones that come out. They just come out, you know? Yes. And you look back and go, where did that come from? That is cool. And then you want to redo it. You want to refine it or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're already, not the same. You're polluting it. But um, yeah, so that's. Uh, uh, that, that That is, I, I love that so much. And, and because, you know, I think it's very, there's a lot, there's a lot of people out there myself included at times over the years where you do over prepare, you know, or you get into that box of like, this is what, you know, the bands that I've been in or, you know, records that I've tried making or did make or whatever, there's a, you know, overthinking the process of how it's going to sound. And, and then, you know, the record never sounds the way you think it's going to sound, you know? Um, and, uh, um, but but even, but definitely for shows, I remember, you know, being in bands uh, and man, practicing, you know, the first band I was ever in, like real band I was ever in uh, with Dan, you know, guest number two, for those of you listening, uh, uh, we, that band played a bunch of shows, but was notorious for just preparing every element like every element of every song, like absolutely. And there was one time and I'll never forget this. I never let this happen again, at least from my, like on my end, you know, but we were, it was, a high, we were in high school or I was in high school and we were doing, um, it was like a battle of the band somewhere on Long Island. And over the course of multiple weeks, you know, so like you play one weekend you get voted. Yeah, you come back to the next weekend. And we got through, I think, a couple of weeks. You know, it was going great. Like, it was like, yes, this is awesome. And then uh, and then there was, there was that one week. I don't know if it was week three or four or whatever. But, every, like, I mean, we was just super. Everything was so rigid, you know, in, the, in, in our structure for how the performance is going to go. And, man one thing after another went wrong like and it was <laughs> it was it was it was what was so interesting about it looking back on it now was we were so rigid in what the set should sound like and look like and be like that there was no room for improvisation now for those of you listening, you've heard many musicians talk about improvisation in the sense of like creating, right? Like a solo or, or you know, coming up with a fill, right? I know you know this, but the people listen. <laughs> but uh, um, 
I'm talking about improvisation in the sense of like, what if something doesn't go according to plan, right? Can you, how do you handle that? Well, we were so rigid. I don't remember what the first domino was, but let's just say like, I remember a string broke on a guitar. I remember that affected the lead singer and the, who was also the rhythm guitar player. And they, they played two different parts and and the the rhythm guitar player slash lead singer wasn't the stronger like wasn't a very strong guitarist like he was he was fine for the parts he was playing but like without the main lead guitar player he he was like this is not going to sound good and so there was an instant panic between the two guitarists the guitarist didn't have any way this has never happened before the string totally broke and we were young, didn't know what to do, like how to navigate his riff or whatever he was playing without a string, you know? And the bass player in the band, <laughs> I guess got nervous and just started like doing a bass solo. Like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and he just... <laughs> and so... I'm trying to react now. So the domino falls to me for sure. My, I do remember me being the end of the form, like the final domino. And so whatever, all that chaos was going on in front of me and I could see the crowd and like these faces of just like, like pure, like wh this is a train wreck, you know? And I go to like do a drum fill and I completely knock over two cymbals. Like, I don't even know how that's possible, you know, now as a drummer. But straight up, cymbal stands go crashing over. And we just stop playing. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so uh, uh, you know it would follow that we did not make it through that round of the battle of the bands uh um, but but that was like that's the thing right like if you're if you are over, so like almost anal about your performance whether that's for a show or for a studio session or even a rehearsal right like i think we've been in we've both been in rehearsal situations where you know, and I might, we played in bands before, and I'm sure I know there was a period of time where I was unbelievably anal about everything being a certain way. And yeah. so I was even the, the, the guilty party um, at times, but, you know, maybe you've been in other bands too, where you've had that. It was like, we're, it's going to be, rehearsal's going to be, got to be this way. You know, we're going to take a break at this time. And, you know, like even down to where you're going to eat, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, if you don't have that room to to go with the flow, like to like you're saying, like to just kind of be where, you know, not to be cliche, but like to see where the music takes you. It's like, that is real. There is something true behind that, you know? Sure. Um, and uh, the key thing too, that sticks out to me though, that I think is important for all the listeners, uh, you know, and you did stress it, but just to double down on it for everybody, especially you young people, you young drummers, um, you know, James mentioned how the, all the work you put in prior, right. Prior to getting ready to do those gigs, you know, it was like, this is not like you just picked up singing or you just picked up the guitar and like you book a show for like a month from now and you're just gonna, you know, like, I don't care how I sound, you know, it's like you spent, you know, more likely than not, you know, at, like maybe years before you played like your first real, real gig where you start really gigging, you know? And so there was so much under your belt that that allows you to have that foundation where you don't have to overanalyze yourself in prep for the upcoming actual thing. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's, I just, I love that. It's interesting. Cause a, another aspect to what you're, you're talking about, like with your, gig is that like you know you have all these things in place and because 
they're supposed to be like that. Mm-hmm. And that it is the importance of that. The priority is so out of whack. It's so high, <laughs> you know, that it's taken yeah. over the ability to just kind of noodle your way out of it if it goes wrong. And yeah. because of that, if it goes wrong, there's so much fear that it freezes things up or you start playing a bass solo, you do something st- Stupid, right? Something insane. <laughs> I was at a recording of this show. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because that care, you know, makes it dysfunctional. So here it yeah. was that like it's not like whereas you know it look a vision can be carried out the way in very little details. Now you you look at like Michael Jackson and. Michael Jackson cared very much about every little detail and, you know, the way his music was set up and everything, every little detail really needed to be in those places. You know, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't room for really anything else. So he had to make sure everything was in place and everything. And, and it, and it goes down to just, like you said, the way things are set up, you got a light show, you got the whole thing. And, and he actually carried it out and it worked. Right. Right. Right, and it worked, right, and he, right. he's had shows that have gone. He has plenty of shows that have gone the way he wanted them to go, and mm-hmm. you could say, "Oh well, that's such a success and everything," but he hated touring. He hated yeah. touring. That, that's he right. Vegas. That's, um, yeah, that's he, right. That's a great clip. Yeah. I love to tour. <laughs> He, he hated it maybe as much as anybody has hated touring. And mm-hmm. who loved it more than anybody? Led Zeppelin. And they right. were the loosest, not to, to, to a fault, you know? And right, it's like right. finding that middle ground, you know, where, you know, obviously Zeppelin in their prime are, are going to be able to noodle their way out of almost anything and turn it into an expression of whatever. But they had the most fun because they weren't over ad. They weren't analyzing at all. It was the freest. And, you know, that's why that's why they, their bootlegs are so sought after. You know, it's got such a um, I think it's like the second most sought after uh, bootlegs, ever, you know, because their magic moments, the ones that purely came out were just uh, they're so so awesome and so powerful that it's like it's worth getting whereas like michael jackson's show from uh you know this place this city at this time in this year and you know another show on that same tour and oh i found this one from that tour too once you heard that those other two you're like ah i i got i heard it i, got I get it. it you know that third yeah. show is going to be the same you know and right. yeah. whereas you know them in their prime and everything probably 72 Every show is different and every show is awesome. And it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's something to look at. You know, there's like a difference in that and everything. And just the fact that Michael Jackson was miserable because it literally was so much work that the, the performance was an act. It was an act mm. through and through. It was not real, you know? And with bands that were much looser, you, you get more of a dose of, of reality. I, I feel like sometimes, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And I, I think uh, for those of you who are listening, who are MJ fans, we love Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah, <laughs> this is no, not a criticism of him. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, and I would, I would, I would just, I would say, I, I almost feel like with, with his stuff where you see the expression is, is that it, it, the studio stuff is the expression that you're talking sure. about. Like, like, sure. you know, cause like you hear those stories of uh, at least, at least during his time with like Quincy Jones, where, you know, Quincy would be trying to produce the vocal in a certain way, like to get a, a particular performance out of it. I think it's a, there's a great story of she's out of my life. I think that's on off the wall where he, it's like a ballad and he, you know, Quincy didn't, you know, wanted a clean vocal, you know, Obviously, who doesn't want that? And uh, Michael just kept weeping at the end of the song, like every take, 
no matter how many takes. So when you listen to the studio recording, uh, you know, off off the wall, you literally hear Michael weeping at the end of the song because he because Quincy's just like I just gave up because I couldn't. No matter how I tried to produce him, like to coach him out of the emotion, he's like I wasn't. It's like I didn't want him to disconnect from the emotion of the song, but I just didn't want him to cry at the end. <laughs> and uh, and he's like, but Michael, you know, just would would cry, you know, which uh, which is really cool because. For those of, of you listeners who, you know, maybe you're, you really want to do studio stuff. Um, I think that's a great example. And, and even what, what you're talking about, like just, you could still bring that freedom into a studio session. You know, you could still have that as prepared as we want to be for the studio. You know, um, obviously you want to be good at your craft, but like you, you're trying to capture like something organic, you know, or, or hopefully you are, you know, for sure. Um, you know, I just also want to say that like the, the example I'm pointing out with Michael Jackson, that very thing that I'm talking about him making sure that everything is in the right place and everything is magnificent. You know what I mean? Oh, that's yeah. not, I was just yeah, having fun. Yeah. Totally. 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 I, I, I think that's, you know, on, on the other side of the coin, it's incredible. And the fact that, it is possible to get a precise, detailed vision now. At least for him, it's possible, you know, but it's been right. done. And that's a really yeah. big deal. And that, that's the only way he was going to be satisfied. And he's Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? So right. it's like, I, right, right, right. it's just for me, uh, you know, what works for me is definitely a looser thing. And that's why I say, like, a lot of people may not even find that valuable, you know, but. I I almost think though that I almost think, no, I love what you're saying because, and I almost think that, you know, look at the toll it took on him, even just in the quote that you were making that he, he hated to tour so much, you know, it was, it, you know, you know, for the people listening to this podcast, like I, everybody listening, like loves to play the drums, you know, and maybe it, there might be some non drummers listening too, uh, from what I understand, but you know, we, we all love to play our instruments. So like, we don't, we don't want to get to that point where it's just like, you know, I hate to play the gig on the weekend, you know, but I like to practice in my practice room. Like, no, no, you should love to play the gig, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I think the lesson for everybody here is a really important one of the, of the, uh, I like the comparison of the looseness of like how you, you like to work, but also how you, you connected that to Zeppelin and then, you know, making that comparison with, you know, someone like, like an artist like MJ, who is, you know, very meticulous, you know, and it's beautiful and it's amazing, but you do see the toll. And then you can see the toll that it took on the rest of his life. You know, like I, I would say that there was probably a connection there, you know, potentially, you know, with how overanalyzing he was and, uh, you know, with his music, you know, I mean, like, look at, not to go on an MJ tangent here, but like, you know, I love the music he made in the 90s. I think it's unbelievable. Like, if we were getting music today like that, I would be thrilled. But I do always wonder, what if he just stayed working with Quincy Jones? Because there is no doubt a difference between the three albums with Quincy Jones and the three albums he did with where he was the main guy, but he did, you know, there were other producers like famous producers that he was exploring with. And I understand the intent as an artist to want to say, well, I want to, I want to try something different. I want to see what I can do without my, you know, my mentor, you know, there, there's something to be said for that. Um, but you, we have that ability to armchair quarterback now and look back and be like, yeah, like, you compare dangerous, you know, from 1992 or something like that, 91, 92, 93, to, which is the first album without Quincy. And you just compare it to 1988 with Bad, you know, it's like Bad is, you know, it's what's, still, it sounds. What's the story behind that? Why, why did they stop working together? Because Michael just wanted to see what he could do. Michael wanted to see what he could do. He wanted to, he wanted to, he felt like, I mean, there's a lot of different rumors about it. I mean, I, you know, there are some people that talk about, you know, Michael felt that Quincy was too old, like getting too old. Like he didn't have the, 
the new sounds that were coming. I don't know if that's true because they always, from to my knowledge, they've always had a great relationship. Um, I did hear something. I think Quincy was interviewed after Michael passed that Michael had reached out to him. I don't know how true this is, but I'm pretty sure I read this as a quote from Quincy Jones that Michael had reached out to him to want to do another album. Like at the end. Yeah. Which is like, oh my gosh, I would have, it would be amazing. You know, like what would, it would have been the greatest thing ever. But like I uh, recently, I've been listening to, you know, his music again because my, uh, my niece is loving his music and it's unbelievable. Like those recording, the, the, the three records with Quincy is just like, it sounds like it was recorded today. You know, no, I remember one time I, you put those, you put those songs, like if you like insert the MP3 in like a, like, you know, logic or garage band or something. And if you insert a, another song, like you just look at the waveform, like the waveform is perfect. And then like all these other songs, the waveform, like real hits, like these are other hits, but like the waveforms are like, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, it's just, even down to something like that, just the audio yeah. quality yeah. of, of something off, from off the wall or thriller or bad. And uh, yeah, man, it just, it, it's, um, there was a looseness there too, I think dur during those, because he had Quincy, you know, there was a looseness. You can hear it in the recordings. Things become more syncopated and rigid and edgy. And, and I understand like, you know, the nineties were a different time with like hip hop coming up. So Michael was trying to bring that influence in and it's definitely cool. You know, like the, those songs sound great, but um, I mean, for, for the, for the drummers listening, I mean, I don't think that the records that are fun to play are definitely the, uh, you know, listening to those guys. I think Toto played a lot on, like, was like the backing band. You're kidding. From what I understand. Yeah, I remember listening to, I had gotten, it was like the the 20th anniversary record of Thriller. <laughs> and it had, it had like, this is when I was in high school, and it had like interviews with Quincy Jones. And I'm pretty sure I remember in one of those interviews, he was talking about how like, the musicians on th of Toto, he would call to do the studio sessions because they were just so killing, yeah. you know, yeah. um, which like makes a lot of sense. Like you listen to like the, the great band, you know, but I don't know how true it is, but I, I got to go back and dig up that recording. But I, I remember, you know, about like, Mike I mean, those, those session and, players. Yeah. Michael Cole and yeah. I feel like yeah. I may have seen that clip too. Okay. I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. I saw recently um We Are the World. Oh, yeah, the documentary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it the doc Is it should I watch it? I haven't seen it yet. You have to watch it for one. Okay. Minute. And it's, <laughs> okay. Lionel, it's Lionel Richie telling a story about Michael Jackson that's going to have you in stitches. Even more so you're going to think of me how this thing's going on. You're gonna laugh so hard, dude. I thought about you. Why? Really? It was. It's just one of those <laughs> moments. The way he's telling it. <laughs> I don't know. I just. I just. Man, <laughs> me and Nick would be having a laugh over this. But um, it's just <laughs> so so funny and so bizarre. <laughs> you can't, you can't make it up. It is too good. Um, definitely see it just for that and the whole Bob Dylan thing that goes down. It's. Blacked out. Oh, I gotta see it. Yeah, there's a there's a good story about Michael in there. But um, so yeah, so what else? No, this is this has been super awesome, and I I really appreciate the. Uh, I think everybody's gonna take a lot from. There's so much to take from this. What we just been talking about about under preparing, over preparing for gigs and things like that. Like it's so huge, and. Um, and it, it, it's not even like for, it doesn't just apply to quote unquote professional musicians, you know, like if it's, it's a great thing to want to just get together with friends and maybe eventually play some shows just for fun. And I still think the under prepare over prepare thing is so important to consider, you know, because you want to enjoy that, you know, it's like making music is making music. Like you said, 
a hobby or not, you know, it doesn't have to be a business. Like, like you said earlier today, you know, um, um, yeah, man, I, I think, um, so that's been, I mean, we covered, we covered so much. I, some of the other things I, I was interested in is like, um, well, I guess you mentioned you're in the process of making a record. Um, what's the, and, and, and your process has kind of changed. It sounded like you were saying as like maybe compared to, you know, years ago being in other bands, is that kind of a similar thing in the sense of like what we were just talking about with, um, uh, you know, preparing for a gig or something like that, like being over prepared. Is that like a similar journey where like maybe, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> like you, when you work on something creatively, this is the, this is the first thing that I'm working on creatively that I'm not collaborating with. It's just me. So okay. I really had to learn how to, how to feel about it. You know, it's uh and again, like what aspects to prioritize and, and that just kind of ha happens naturally as you're experiencing that. And um, I would say yeah. that I've learned a lot of how to not burn myself out with it, which is so important. Um, yeah. You know, you can go through like periods, pretty long periods, like a month long period of just burning the oil right mm -hmm. like full blast and mm -hmm. you can get and most likely will get a lot out of it you know when i when i first yeah. started playing guitar um after the after the zeppelin thing when i was 17 i that's all i did for three months yeah and <laughs> with everything that i did in those three months i and learned i pretty much didn't really learn more than that for a long time. Wow. Um, okay. I got to a level that I thought was impressive and I was like, Oh yeah. All right, you know, and I just, I didn't put okay. that kind of work in like that. That was the, that was the hardest I worked on guitar was in the very first three months until 2020 when I um, started trying to do the uh, three piece thing I told you about. Um, I had just been in this other band that I, I uh, required a lot of guitar work and I got back into it the way I used to. And it was just a tremendous amount. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you're burning yourself out, you know, at some point. If you're creating, it's like, you know, you could really burn yourself out bad. Um, it's a lot for me. Creation is a lot of energy. Um if I have like goals set that I'm like, you know, it's, you got to just take it easy on yourself, but remain consistent in devoting time. And that's yeah. it. And it doesn't have to be this intense time. You just have to look at what it is that you have ahead of you and pick one part of it. What is the appropriate thing to be working on? You know, this next step, you know? Let's yeah. put an hour into, you know, listening to these files and taking notes on, on, you know, what times, you know, we really like of this creation of this mm -hmm. idea and that idea, you know, and it's just as simple as that, because a lot of the time you could burn yourself out and be like, and then stay away from it for a while. And then you come yeah. back and it's not as familiar. And, and I can guarantee to you that if you had just taken it easy with it from the beginning, you'd be further than you would have if you just put all the enthusiasm in at once. And and that's that was not easy to learn because when I get excited yeah. about things, I'm, I'm like pushing the pedal to the metal, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I have to just, you know, it's it's the wisdom over time to be like, okay, you know, let's just back away from that. Let's just promise ourselves we're going to do it tomorrow no matter what. You got to prioritize it no matter what, you know, pretty much oh. outside of something emergency. And that's it. Um, I, I love that. That's huge, man. That's huge for everybody to hear that's listening to this because, um, I mean, you can directly, in my opinion, you can directly relate that to learning an instrument. 
too, you know, like it's like, um, or, or for, for those people who are in bands, you know, maybe you're a drummer listening to this and you've got a band and you've got an original band and you guys are trying to write songs and play shows and eventually record. Maybe you got a battle of bands coming up. You don't want to break a string, have to play a bass solo, knock over your cymbals. Um, you know, uh, man, that's so healthy. Like, like the consistency over, you know, the, oh, I need to practice for five hours today. Like, it's like, I have to, you know, it's like, no, just like, just do something, you know, like that little, I talk about that a lot with people is like, I, you know, if you're struggling to, I say it a lot in the context of like, if you're struggling to find time, if you, if you feel like in your head, you should at least be practicing for, for an hour or for X number of hours, let's say, right. If that's like, for whatever reason in your head, that that's what you should be doing. And you're failing at doing that. I often tell people like, we'll stop thinking about that. You know, like, like, let's, let's just do, can you do five minutes tomorrow? Can you do 10 minutes? Can you do 15? Does any of that sound doable? Cause everybody's different, right? Like for some people, 15, if I say 15, they're like, yeah, that's all oh, I could, you know what? I could do 15. Some people I say 15 and they think, they think 30. They're like, well, I should round it to 30. And that sounds like a lot because I can't even do an hour. So then I'll go like, well, what about 10? What about five? Can you give me five minutes of playing the drums tomorrow? And then can you do that again the next day? You know, it's so much more attainable. And then often, right? Don't you find that there are like, moments where you're like feeling really good like you've you've consistently maybe did those 5 10 15 minutes of creation like songwriting or producing or playing the drums or the guitar or something and it's like you know what i i could go for five more minutes right now like i'm going to i'm going to say sometimes that happens you know and then before you, you know have it. that great session before you know well, it, you what what <laughs> 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 Trust me. <laughs> no, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I met this guy in our group when we went to Cuba who plays an instrument called the stick. Oh, yeah. You know, dude, I jammed with somebody who, yeah, I, I jammed with somebody once who played the stick. It's crazy. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's, it's bass and guitar the, are in one. Yeah. You bass and guitar. Yeah. And he plays two hours a day and has just has not missed a day in like 14 years or something like that. What's his name? Harry. No. No, that's not who I play with. Okay. I gotta, I gotta find his last Dude, time. I've only met one person that plays the stick. So like I you it's know there. it can be the sick. There. It's yeah. There. Um and he showed me some of his stuff that he like wrote on it, and I was like, wow, it was it was awesome. You know? Yeah. Um two hours a day though. Two hours How does he day, not burn he, himself out? He worked himself, you know, like two hours is not the end of the world when you've been doing it for a long time. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, I definitely like, you know, five minutes, like just five minutes. It Every second makes a difference. Every second yeah, makes absolutely. a difference. And, you know, knowing when it's time to kind of like put it aside, you know, you, something misfires and some, you know, Okay, it's exhausting. It's exhausting itself. Yeah. Right? But uh, like you said, everybody's different. So just learning yourself with that and, you know, you, just, you do the best you can with that. But it, it is definitely, it's hard to consider for a lot of people a small amount of time like that. But sometimes yeah. it's the best thing to do and you just you just got to do it. It's a, It's 100% the best. Yeah, no, well, because we live in a society of like no pain, no gain mantra you know and so which is so wrong in my opinion for especially for drummers because people think like oh drummers must be like totally jacked you know i don't know why they I think like, i mean i do know why they gotta see blood on that drum. yeah like whiplash you gotta see blood on the drum yeah i love that movie but that's it's just crazy mm -hmm. uh you know <clears throat> but yeah like like no actually you should it it's you know, quite the opposite, you know, um, as far as playing, like, like you, you don't want to feel any pain, you know, but yeah, like, I feel like the no pain, no gain thing. And it's like, you know, the hustle culture, 
um you know that's so popular over the last look i feel I'll, like i'll say this eight years there's a lot of benefit to that for a lot of people and it would never have gained traction if, if there wasn't but what we're talking about is kind of like a slow and steady wins the race type of thing and i guess it's more like not as intense and mm -hmm. steady, steady more than anything, you know? Ste yeah. Something yeah. that you can handle steadily and consistently, you know, could, could, you could practice, you know, maybe five hours a day for two days and then, okay, that third day, you know, it's going to be 15 minutes. Um, what yeah, is yeah. it? What is it <clears throat> that you're comfortable pushing for consistently that you find that golden place and you are going to feel very rewarded often, you know, yes. and, and you're going to feel really good about that. You're going to get good a lot quicker and it's just going to be, like you said, healthier because it's not healthy to have to stop or, or lose interest and then come back to it and feel that somewhere in you, that kind of failure that's like, hmm, yeah. this isn't what I planned it to be. You know, I thought I was mm -hmm. going to go you know, balls to the wall until April or something, you know, and it's on my second yeah. day. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you, you well, you also like, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I also think too, the, the practice for like being worried about like, oh, practicing for five hours or like, you know, or I'm, I, you know, I wish I could practice for eight hours a day, you know, like for those, for those people listening who are in music school, obviously when you're in music school, that's all you're doing is playing music all the time. That's like a part of being in music school. But, you know, for people who are not in that, that world, um, I think we get in, like we, we put, because of the no pain, no gain mindset, we go into learning an instrument thinking, okay, well, it's about how many hours I practice that's going to give me playing like Jimmy Page or playing like Prince or playing like Stuart Copeland, you know, it's like, no, it's not. It's, it's like you're saying, it's the consistency. You can, you can learn so much in short bursts, but consistent throughout the week or consistent throughout the month. You know, it's like, rather than being like, well, <clears throat> I practice every day you know, seven days a week for two hours and I don't feel any different. Like, why don't I feel any different? And I think often it's because you're probably looking at the clock, like mm -hmm. you meaning like, you're like, okay, you know, it's, it's 1 PM. I'm going to practice until three and then 15 minutes in whatever you're doing. Okay. It's all right. It's one fifteen. I'm, I'm just got to get to three. I just got to get to three. What does that mean? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, you're thinking about the next thing, you know, like you're thinking about just getting to three. So you can say you did your two hours of practice and then you're going back to real life. It's like, well, well why are we learning the instrument then? You know, do you care? Like, were you even focused on the groove you were learning or were you even focused on the chord progression you were writing? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, like where, you know, or were you thinking about what's for dinner, you know, or were you thinking about, you know, watching, Peaky Blinders or something like that, you know, like, it's like, um, that's why I think, I mean, I used to be like that. I used to be like, I got a clock. It's like clock in the time. Like, not that I was like thinking about watching something on TV, but like that idea of like, I gotta have like my practice, like just completely organized and like, it's good to be organized, but it, but you can take it too far, I guess, is what, what we've been talking about. You know, like you can like over prepare. We've been talking about, you know, mm -hmm. it's so interesting. I'm just so happy to hear, you know, what you've been saying about it. I, I think it's so good for people to hear, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> especially in today's world, like learning, learning an instrument in today's world. It's like, yeah, it's the best thing, but I think it is the best thing for you. Like, like, like what, to go back to kind of the early part of the conversation about leisure and hobby and doing it this, for this higher level thing, you know, it's like, we need to tap into that more, you know, and not, not just like, 
I don't know, for some practical reason to learn an instrument or something like that. No, there's no practical reason. You know, there's, there's a deeper reason, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, like, well, I'm sure it's evolved for you as well, you know, um, over the years where, where, uh, where it's come from to keep it going. And, um, yeah, man, you to where you're at now. Um, yeah, absolutely. We haven't jammed in a real long time. I see those clips of you on the on Instagram, and I'm like, wow. I mean, it's definitely nothing I've ever seen from you, and it's really oh uh, man, really thanks. Really cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, we are gonna we are gonna jam. I know that's that's been uh, that's been uh, something we've been talking about for like the last two months or whatever. But it's yeah. it's going to happen super soon. It's just been crazy with getting this thing off the ground, um, you know, this, uh, online, the online portion of my teaching business has just been, uh, consuming the last two months, but things are getting together now, which is great. Like I'm really starting to find a groove with like, you know, just making all this stuff. And, um, so it's going to be a lot easier to, uh, to get together. Cause I, I can't wait. It's going to be so yeah. cool. It's going to be so cool. And that means a lot, man, to hear you say that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I've been having fun with, uh, I mean, as you know, I've been, you know, since, so like last November, I've been listening to like Zeppelin like crazy, you know? Um, and so, so that inspired me on like, you know, my YouTube where I've been doing these little, I just started doing these little lessons on like some random John Bonham stuff, like not, like things that like everybody does the obvious like bottom triplet or the shuffle from fool in the rain or like, you know, um, I don't know, a whole lot of love, the groove, you know, the groove to a whole lot of love is like iconic, you know, like all the iconic stuff, like everybody. <clears throat> and that's not to say I, I won't cover that. I, I probably will at some point, but like I picked the bridge to fool in the rain as the first one that I ever did, because I always felt like I've never heard anybody talk about it. Like it's because so, obviously John Paul Jones is like the, the vibe in that section, you know, like that, like Latin piece thing that he does. But um, I always like as a drummer and like, like a, just a young drummer, I always thought that was such a cool snare pattern he was playing, you know, and then like he overdubbed the Roto Toms on top and stuff. But like the but just that pattern, you know, just so cool. And it's not like if you've never done it as a drummer, it's not an easy thing to make sound cool and good. Like there's a lot of dynamics that Bonham's playing with there on the snare drum on top of the fact that he's got this pulse in the kick that's not letting up, you know? Um, so like I picked that and then I picked um, uh, the second one I just did last week that lesson just came out was uh, the... I don't know if it's like if you'd officially call it the bridge, but because I feel like there's like a thousand bridges in how many more times, but like the hunter part, you mm -hmm. know, of like of that coming out of, I think the, I think that comes out of the boat, right? Like after the, yeah, that groove on the drums, I've never seen anybody really talk about it, but it's so good. It's like, the, it's like, I mean, the whole, I mean, the whole thing, the riff that Paige and, jones are playing is just and obviously plant's vocal is insane there it's a great melody and um was that a was that a cover like was that an old bluesy thing that they sure, inserted the or the lyrics so that's, that's what i mean like the, yeah at least the lyrics but so all the music there is them sorry all the music there like like that's them that like they they incorporated lyrics into I believe that, you know, when you're hearing this stuff, it's pretty much musically, you know, Paige's riffs were yeah. pretty much, you know. Um, it was, That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. It was Plant's uh, lyrics that were borrowed or stolen, whatever. Not his. Um, a lot of the time when they were in those early days. But uh, that section, as far as I know, it's just the lyrics. Um, you know, he puts his own name okay. in there and, you know, but, um, 
it's a really cool part and the drums are you know i'll i'll never i'll never forget the first time i heard that part i had never listened to the whole song before i guess you know at a certain point i always knew like the mm -hmm. riff and you know, the breaks and i always loved the melody of the verse you know coming into it um and i was supposed to go to france with my family and uh, we found out my grandmother was sick and we, we turned around on our way to the airport and um wow i was like what and we, we went we got gas and one of my father's friends was at the gas station he was going to be going dropping something off at the house anyway and um i was like let me ride with you and uh i just got in the car with i heard how many more times playing in the car and i was like oh let me get in there so i'm, I'm listening to it <laughs> that part came up and i was like is this it was just a whole new level of cool that the rest of the song oh, know, was good enough and then you get to that part, yeah. it's just like, yeah oh man it's and, out, and out of control cool. it's the coolest part of the song yeah it's the coolest part of the song oh and those the drums are unbelievable and i you could probably send me something but it, i've never because you dove into the bootlegs way more than I did, but I've never heard him play that part the way he does on the record. Quite that Probably way. Not. Probably not. Yeah. And it's a I shame because, like, I know... Oh, that's so cool to hear you say that because, like, I, I didn't know if I just didn't do enough research, but I, I... And it makes it more special to me, like, that section. is like, more special because it was never... Like, I just certainly... I really have never heard it felt that way and it, and that is natural right so for everybody listening like it is it is natural when, especially when you're in like rock bands or funk bands the energy on stage is always a little elevated from whatever the studio recording was um and so often things could be maybe slightly too fast for you police fans everything was too fast um but uh you know uh but there's something so perfect about the pocket in the studio recording of that section of, of all of how many more times, but that section when he comes in with that snare groove. And again, it's like snare kick, left foot, hi hat, so killer. But so that's what I've been doing is like, just like trying to find these cool bottom moments that are under talked about, you know? And, but I think, Man, I think you learn. I think you can learn so much more from those two grooves than just learning the the bottom triplet fill. You know, like because those yeah. two grooves. Yeah, yeah. Of course, man. Yeah. There's there's so yeah. much there in, in that in that groove. The other one you said was, uh, oh, the, the uh, bridge of fool in the rain. The, the piano. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, man. That that's just filled with, you know, uh, like you said, dynamic. Um, yeah the necessary for it is just like you know it's on a whole nother level um you know and it's the, relentless right it's so like you said the pocket the feel yeah. you know when, when your body's reacting inside in that way where you hear it and it's almost hypnotizing it's like you know you know they're they're doing it right you know and yeah. live he was just uh, he never uh, as far as I, I haven't heard every bootleg but i've heard a lot and i specifically go to that part a lot of the time of the early bootlegs oh uh, that's cool and um i have to say that like he's definitely he uses that part to be creative yeah also, so i don't know if i've ever heard it exactly the same time on two same way on it, two yeah. different bootlegs um, but I yeah. also don't think it's ever been quite as cool as it was on the album, you know, and I, I agree with you there. It's, uh, it's got hundred percent. It, it's the right tempo. Like you said, you know, um, and just the, the, the accent pattern he chooses there too is and you're right. You're reminding me of like, he definitely does improvise. He's using that as a creative thing, a creative outlet, which is, which is very important. Um, but yeah, it was never quite, as funky and awesome as as the studio recording which is which can be the opposite often right like some sometimes you know we'll we'll find bands or artists and be like man the the live version is 
from that one show was like absolutely ripping, you know, and like the studio is all right, you know, it's cool, but you know, it's, it's cool when you find the, the reverse. So, um, you have been incredibly gracious with your time, um, thinking about winding down here, but I can't not talk to you without having you talk about favorite drummers. It could be, could be, uh, I kind of do this with everybody. Uh, it could be a studio thing, could be a live thing. It could be, you know, a, a full album. It could just be a band, it could be a, a drummer backing an art, like whatever, I don't care. Doesn't matter the genre, you know, favorite drummers, doesn't have to be a specific number, but any drummers, obviously we've been talking about John Bonham, maybe you want to talk mm. more about him, but but any anything, any drummers you love and maybe some reasons like some 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 whys behind that if that's cool and if all you want to do is talk about john bottom i'm certainly happy to do that <laughs> um, i know i kind of put you on the spot here but i want to say um just want to make sure i'm getting this right yeah 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 uh john bottom is mm -hmm. my favorite um, if there's somebody else that I've heard that um, has made me just um, that has inspired me to want to play the drums, it's Buddy Rich. Wow, cool. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything that I've seen of him. And I, I just the reason I, I had to look that up because I, I almost said Gene Krupa, and I'm like, no, it's not him. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Buddy Rich um, is coming from that place that is just, it's like unfathomable for most drummers, I think. You know, mm -hmm. they're, where he's coming from and how in tune he is with what's happening inside it's all aligned and it's just streaming out of him you know we, we were talking before yeah. about like, practicing and making sure those those aspects and those tools are just right at your disposal to where you're not even thinking about it, it's just expressing and yeah there was just so much there and there was so much experience there and he just probably had a magnificent natural uh, way of, you know, getting this stuff in him as well. You know what I mean? There's no doubt he he's a he's a special guy. Yeah, man. It you know you want to talk about layers to what he's doing that are just it's just riveting. It's unbelievable, and and that's very inspirational that makes me want to start at the fundamentals just and just do it every just like we're I talking it. about you know it's it's so inspiring I it. so i would say um him and john bottom i mean obviously i think buddy rich is probably a lot better than john bottom um wow okay yeah for sure um but Buddy Rich never would have done what John Bonham did over that. And I think that John Bonham had that over Buddy Rich, even if it's naivety that he had over him, you know, it, mm. it served its purpose perfectly. And that's part of yeah, it. Yeah. So, you know, I can't say that I like Buddy Rich better than Bonham. You sure. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just attached to the Zeppelin thing, I suppose. But um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I would have to say about that. You know, I love it. It's not that I, I've never been um, wowed by a bunch of other drummers and everything, but those two guys are the ones that make me want to play drums. That's that's what that's what I'm looking for with this with this question. Yeah, man, I love it. Um, what uh, is there? Just as a follow up to that, is there? Uh, a particular album you would recommend 
it doesn't have to be what you think is the most impressive drumming album, but is there a particular album doesn't have to be from those two drummers either um, that you just think has just every drummer should listen to in a sense of maybe groove or, or, or just musicality, like, like, even if it's not a drum thing, but I, cause I feel like I know I am influenced often by, um, I mean, we were, we were texting the other day and we, I, I briefly mentioned how much I love Bob Dylan. Like I, I can, I could be, be inspired by just listening to Bob Dylan. And then that makes me want to play the drums. So is there an album or albums that you would recommend the listeners listen to, like really dig in, like not pa- passive listening, but active listening. Um, mm, you know, I hate to. Uh, you could punt on the question too. That's fine. Say that again. I was gonna say you could punt on the question too. That's fine. <laughs> no, no. I, I would say that the um, disc one of Zeppelin BBC Sessions is probably cool. the most rich example, uh, the most inspirational example of drums, and and honestly the whole band in a way for that matter, but the drums are so good that awesome. Yeah, man. Like I I'm always, every time I hear that for me, it's like the drums are standing out, you know? And wow. of course they play a lot of songs where the drums can do that a lot more because, you know, there's like a lot of slow blues there and stuff, but uh, it's just nothing in the way it, it's divine you know what i mean for me it's, oh, it's you know it's unreal it. it's just timing his feel you know how how light and how hard he's hitting every single thing it's just i it's something i would not change one little piece of at all and that's i love uh, it you know when you feel like that that about something so i would say as far as like uh inspiration it would be that and to try to which i haven't heard really but to try to um the best you can if it's something you you can taste and something that you love so much about every little just the air about it you know try the best you can to 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 make that happen in some way you get a little piece of that un, under your belt and you know, it should be, it can't be bad. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Ah, dude, thank you so very much for joining us on the drum shed podcast, video cast, whatever. Uh, hopefully have you back. That would be super cool to, uh, talk about more things, um, music and otherwise. Um, but just thank you so much. This has been thank so you. much fun. Very cool. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, man. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you real soon. All right. Talk soon. Bye. I just want to say, you just, you just inspired me though. We should do, I mean, I always envisioned we would have another one of these if you enjoyed it, you know, but we should do one where, did you mean like that we didn't dive more into the visitors in general? Is that what you meant? Like, yeah, that we yeah didn't... There, there should have been maybe a little bit more of that. Um, just about, well, you know what personalities and bands and stuff, you know, and well, well, you know what? I mean, this is great. I mean, I look, I'm learning as I go through this, you know, oh, yeah. uh, you know, doing this, but I think that's a really cool idea for an additional episode. Like we could go in with, you know, this is what we want to cover. Like, Hey guy, like today we're talking about interpersonal dynamics in bands, you know, and we're going to, we're going to talk about, we're going to peel back the veil into bands. It's going to be the funniest episode you've ever It'll had. be, let's do it next week. You know? <laughs> 
Um, no, yes, it'll and everything, you know, dude. Tainted Brian, like spitting in your face, like <laughs> it's fantastic. You know what? This little moment. This is. I'm gonna clip this. This will be a post credit scene teaser. For the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. So-